Good morning. I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, speak on this panel about religion, peace, and sustainable development. I'm going to focus this morning particularly on uh, the issue of speech that harms and uh, the role that religious groups uh, can have in uh, creating an atmosphere of peace uh, in addressing these uh, challenging situations. Of course, we meet in the shadow of even more offensive uh, work that is done in the name of uh, religion sometimes as well, uh, the, uh, the terrorist attacks that we've seen here in Turkey, in France, and in other places, uh, including the airline uh, over Egypt in, in recent days. I want to t think analytically a little bit about uh, the speech uh, dynamic. Uh, from a first view, when we think of harmful speech, we often think of the speaker and the target. Uh, the speaker is someone who says something that is insulting or designed to intimidate or marginalize or harm, and then the target or the victim uh, may retaliate, <coughs> respond, resist, or ignore. Sometimes we think of this as a fighting words uh, paradigm where the speaker speaks and if their speech is so provocative, the uh, target will respond by punching them in the nose. Uh, this is sometimes known as fighting words and uh, the speaker is inciting violence or uh, hatred uh, in the target. But I think this model of what happens is actually quite uncommon. Uh, a second view suggests that there's another party involved, and this is the audience uh, that is incited to violence. More often than the speaker becoming violent, we sometimes have the audience that becomes incited in some way. Here we have inflammatory speech, which may be nevertheless protected unless it was intended to incite and likely to incite imminent lawless activity. Here we notice something important. We notice that the dynamic involving speech is not simply a dynamic involving the speaker and the target, but also involving an audience. Uh, we might think of this as the speaker affinity group. But this too is a little bit of an oversimplification. It turns out that in most situations, there are multiple audiences. We might think of these as the speaker affinity group. These are those who might be incited to action against the target group. But we also have the victim affinity group. These are those who might be incited to action in defense of the target group. And so, for example, uh, the speaker affinity group might be motivated by the speaker uh, who tells them uh, to act in the name of hate and they might then act in a way that targets the victim. But the victim affinity group is actually quite important as well because the victim affinity group might uh, react to the hate speech, but it doesn't happen automatically. If we think of some of the main uh, examples of hateful speech uh, that have resulted in violence in recent years, uh, whether it is something like the Innocence of Muslims <coughs> film or uh, the Danish cartoons, it turns out that there's actually quite a long period of time that passes between the time that the speaker speaks and the reaction takes place. Uh, and I want to think a little bit about what happens in those intervening days, weeks, or months. Because after all, not every burning of the Koran or burning of the Bible, however offensive and objectionable that action may be, results in violence. Sometimes it does. But when it does, what happens? What makes that reaction uh, precipitate? Well, I want to talk about the possibility of there being accelerants and decelerants that help transform harmful speech into violent reprisal. This is an image that's taken from uh, fires. Uh, if we think of someone who's trying to burn down a building, an arsonist, and analogize them to the hateful speaker, uh, there's actually uh, 
if you want to burn down a building, you're not just going to light a match. You're going to, first of all, try to spread an accelerant around that building. Uh, uh, an accelerant is something that speeds up a reaction or inflames passion. With a fire, this could be something like gasoline. This is something that ignites easily. It burns hot. It may be susceptible to flashpoints. And the analogs in the speech context, I think, are quite obvious. Uh, these are things that are designed to inflame a mob to make appeals to masses, or to uh, appeal to the honor. And it turns out that those who are inflamed are almost a, a, a common demographic. They're usually young men. Uh, it's usually young men that are inflamed to action in response to the hate speech, to be inflamed by the speaker to hate the target, or the victim affinity group tends to be young men that are inflamed to rise to the defense or to speak out or to react to preserve the honor of the group that is insulted. And so what are the accelerants that uh, take hateful speech and amplify it into uh, violent <coughs> reactions? Similarly, we have decelerants. Uh, this perhaps is a less familiar concept than the accelerants. But if we think of the fire analogy again, decelerants are something that slow down a reaction, that seek to cool or lower temperatures, to lower the volume of a volatile or ex potentially explosive situation. Thinking of the fire analogy, this would be something like a fire retardant. Uh, what are the things or substances that reduce flammability of fuels or delay their combustion, that block uh, the chemical reactions that create fire or initiate chemical reactions that stop fire. That's what I'd like to think about. Well, if we focus on accelerants, we can imagine each of these groups, the speaker, the audience, and the target acting as accelerants that inflame or incite further a difficult or volatile uh, situation. For example, example, the speaker who speaks harmfully might double down and repeat or elaborate their insult. They might say, yes, I really did mean what I seem to say. And this might be a way of inflaming or accelerating uh, the situation. Think of the uh, uh, the, the, the uh, 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 Christian pastor that insists on burning the uh, uh, Quran and does so in a way that's flamboyant and designed to create offense. Think also of the audience, the speaker affinity group. These might pe be people like clergy, those in the media, or social media, or politicians. Uh, these are people who can take that message and then uh, amplify it in ways that uh, create a greater uh, likelihood of uh, violence. And finally, the targets themselves can uh, play an amplifying function. They may become easily provoked. They may take offense. They may demand retaliation. Or they may make appeals to honor, which, while understandable, could have the effect of inflaming uh, the situation. And so I think all of these role players in a harmful speech situation could find themselves intentionally or inadvertently playing the role of an accelerant. But notice, these very same players can act as decelerants as well. Uh, the speaker, for example, could back down or apologize or clarify what they said. Sometimes speech which offends is not designed to be as offensive as it ends up uh, seeming to be. And so the speaker may be in a role of trying to diffuse a situation rather than inflame a situation. Similarly, the audience, the speaker affinity group, uh, might try to decelerate or calm or diffuse a situation. Clergy 
uh, may step in to try to heal or to soothe a situation. The media might take uh, an attitude of care and uh, 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 prudence. Uh, social media as well might light up not with anger and hatred, but with <coughs> an effort to calm or to bring uh, a solace to the victims of the, uh, of, of the action. And indeed, there may be ways that angry young men can be transformed into less angry young men uh, by finding constructive ways to help channel their anger and indignation in ways that are constructive rather than destructive. Finally, the target. What can the target do? Well, perhaps they can ignore the provocation uh, or accept an apology when the speaker uh, 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 speaks clarification or perhaps even responding with love rather than hate. Think of the audience itself as a decelerant. First, the speaker affinity group. These are people who would be expected to respond to the hatred spoken in the hate speech or the offensive speech. That affinity group could disavow or distance themselves from that action. They could reject the provocation and empathize with victims. What about the victim affinity group? They too could advocate for constructive change, engage in peaceful protest, or uh, create education about the harm. I think we're just beginning uh, to think constructively about these issues of accelerants and decelerants. Because in the hate speech context, we tend to focus exclusively on the speaker and their offense or their intent and the victim and how they should respond and uh, how they should react. But I believe actually much more important perhaps, at least in figuring out how to diffuse rather than accelerate situations, may be to think more systematically about the audiences. So for example, uh, tactics for deceleration. And this list is meant to be very tentative. I'm actually embarrassed at how superficial it looks because I don't think I, perhaps uh, along with us in general, have gotten very far in thinking about the deceleration uh, tactics. But for example, before a provocation takes place, here think of the burning of a Koran, for example. What can be done? Well, we could be sensitive to early indicators of uh, social hostility. Uh, we could respond to legitimate grievances. We could strive hard to make sure that our legal systems are treating everyone with equal treatment, uh, giving them due process that we are not discriminating, uh, that we are responding to harmful speech with uh, counter speech. It turns out that the, the type of hate speech which results in a trigger of uh, a violent reaction often never takes place in a vacuum. It's usually the culmination of actions and failures to react. Uh, we saw, for example, uh, just this week in the United States, the response in the University of Missouri to a long history of disrespectful actions that were taken against African Americans, and it resulted in a strong reaction, an explosive reaction. But that explosive reaction was simmering for a long time. And just as fires seem to ignite suddenly, usually there are embers that are burning quite hot that are not very noticeable uh, before that fire takes place. What about during the provocation? Well, we can respond to harmful speech with counter speech. We can empathize with those who are targets of the hatred, showing solidarity with the victims. We can utilize social media as well as traditional media to create calm rather to, than to inflame passions. And after the provocation as well, when normal seems to have returned, I think we need to think constructively about what we can do in the aftermath to uh, create 
um, communities that are more inclusive and to address the underlying causes. I've been thinking about this this week as we have uh, come here uh, to uh, Istanbul. Uh, we had these terrible terrorist attacks in France. Now, this is obviously a very extreme form of hate speech. It's a speech that actually escalates into uh, a terrorist activity. But notice some of the responses to this that were spontaneous in the target audience. Uh, those who were designed to be terrorized, those who were designed to respond with hatred. Instead, we saw a remarkable and I think quite inspiring spontaneous effort to diffuse and to decelerate the tensions that were raised. One of the most moving was this Jean Julien uh, graphic artist who came immediately in his Facebook account with a symbol of peace rather than hatred to respond to the uh, terrorist attacks. Almost immediately, this response uh, was echoed and repeated in a variety of ways uh, through candlelight vigils, uh, uh, people placing it in makeshift uh, 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 signs on their clothing, uh, even painted on the face of a child. Isn't that a poignant image of the hope for the future, the hope of the innocent and the vulnerable being one of peace and love rather than hatred? Uh, groups gathering together and uh, uh, spontaneously repeating uh, this image. Uh, again, uh, on clothing in places of, Im uh, of significant uh, uh, symbolic importance. Uh, this is Madison Square Garden, uh, where before a hockey game, uh, the uh, symbol was utilized. Athletes painted it on the sides of their shoes. Uh, informal uh, depictions in chalk uh, before a market. Uh, again, vigils uh, where the symbol became very powerful. Notice the power of groups coming together and in peaceful, quiet uh, protests standing against hatred. We also saw it in the symbol symbolism of uh, simply uh, uniting together. Uh, uh, I've talked to some of my French friends who were brought to tears by the symbolic sol solidarity uh, of a variety of people in a variety of places. But it wasn't just the French that wanted to display the French flag. It was the Germans. It was those in the United Kingdom. It was the Australians. Isn't that a magnificent image of the Sydney Opera House? An iconic, immediately recognizable symbol lit up to say, we stand together against violence, against hatred. Uh, New York, uh, the One World uh, 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 Trade Plaza where the terrorist act attacks of 9-11 took place. Uh, uh, Washington Square Park, uh, the Empire State Building. Here we see Brazil, we see Canada, we see Tokyo. Around the world, within hours, uh, spontaneous responses which are designed to decelerate rather than accelerate the hatred and violence. Here, Israel, uh, uh, a hotel in Tel Aviv, the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Uh, San Francisco, uh, Mexico City, uh, or this is actually India uh, on, on the bottom uh, uh, slide. And we also see uh, those in the affinity group of the terrorists. Uh, acting to diffuse rather than inflame. It's really interesting to see the uh, hashtag not in my name and how powerfully that has uh, been utilized uh, uh, by uh, Muslims who insist that the terrorists do not speak uh, for them. Uh, for example, uh, I was just reading a story uh, on CNN about the not in my name hashtag. Uh, one a woman, a, a, a Palestinian named Ayad, quoted the passage from the Quran, uh, saying, uh, whoever kills an innocent person, it is as though he has killed all of mankind. Others saying, 
to me, terror knows no religion. They are picking and choosing aspects of the religion and twisting and distorting them in order to justify their actions that are unjustifiable. The same artist uh, that came up with that beautiful uh, Eiffel Tower peace symbol in response to the Charlie Hebdo uh, uh, attacks uh, created this graphic art uh, representation, suggesting that the pencil is going to be more powerful than the sword. I use these as examples because they're contemporary, but I think they're also quite uh, moving in their spontaneity and their effectiveness in diffusing the, uh, uh, the anger and the hostility that can result from a form of speech that is actually <coughs> extremely violent, that actually uh, uh, borders into terrorism. And what I'd like us to begin to do uh, individually and collectively is to think about the audience of these activities. Not just the speaker, not just the target, but the audience. Because all of us find ourselves in affinity groups, either with the speaker of hatred or the victims. And in each of these roles, I think we need to think, uh, as these spontaneous responses show us, how we might come up with uh, decelerating tactics that help to calm, heal, and address the underlying grievances uh, that uh, often are at the heart of these uh, various activities. Thank you very much.